एंड वेलकम टू चैनल नंबर सिक्स विदिक आई एम दलजीत अमी फ्रॉम ई एम आर सी पटियाला इन कन्वर्सेशन टूडे वी हैव विद दास प्रोफेसर इश्तियाक अहमद हु इज प्रोफेसर इमरेटस एट यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ स्टॉक होम स्वीडन साइमल्टेनियसली ही इज सीनियर फेलो विद इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ साउथ एशियन स्टडीज एट नेशनल यूनिवर्सिटी सिंगापुर टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस वन ऑफ हिज इम्पॉर्टेंट बुक दैट इज गैरिसन स्टेट पाकिस्तान so welcome professor ishtiaq ahmed thank you very much so uh, let's talk about your book garrison state uh, that is pakistan so just the give complete title would be pakistan the garrison state origins evolution consequences 1947 2011 so in this book i was interested in explaining how come that in 1947 when pakistan had a poorly developed industrial sector uh, the military infrastructure was almost non existent uh, why did pakistan went on to become a state dominated by the military more specifically by the pakistan army so this was the main question so uh, your theoretical framework is based on an article by Harold Laswell that's, that's correct. correct yeah Harold so he Lass- wrote that article in 1940s uh, yes, immediately yes. after uh, right. the second world war no before, before the second world before war. the second world yeah. war so. uh, actually 1937 when the japanese militarism rose okay. that's when he wrote the first then the second time he wrote was in 41 when nazi germany was now waging war and his argument was that the next war uh, will be a total war where the old distinction between civilians and the military will be lost and total war would mean all sectors of society being affected in such a situation the threat of rising uh, a, a, a extremism nazism the soviet union japan would force democracies to themselves start promoting the military and that military will then become the uh, protector it will claim that it alone can protect the nation from total war and as a result democracy will diminish or even be lost it will be just in name all important sectors of society will be uh in the control of the what he called the specialist of violence which is the armed forces and he said they would be claiming to know what is best for the economy what is best for uh education what is the right culture so this was the fear he expressed so he was saying that it is going to be a de facto government de facto government of the military but one precondition was that such societies or garrison states will emerge in industrially advanced countries so this was an idea of has uh, last well i saw all the factors in pakistan but not the industrial development base. industrial yes. base so how do you explain it so i said there is another way of understanding pakistan and that is Hamza Alvi's idea of the post-colonial state. He said that in Pakistan, the state was more developed than the society. Okay, so uh, the state means actually the bureaucracy and the military, and the because in the Marxist theory, the state or state agents are just doing what the ruling class says. But in this theory. Uh, the state was more powerful than the social classes of pakistan this was the argument so i connected the two i said that the pakistani state realized that if it is to gain economic aid and military aid because if you look at the pakistani border created by the partition it was a very strange state the border jinna saab wanted the whole of punjab and whole of bengal but he just got portions of punjab and bengal had he been given the whole of punjab as he demanded 
the border between India and Pakistan would be in Gurgaon, Gurgaon. But the final border was on Lahore. So Lahore, Gujranwala, Sialkot, all is within the reach of the Indian army any time. So from day one, Pakistan was a security conscious state. It became a garrison state by going to the Americans and saying, we will take part in your containment of the spread of Soviet communism. So we become your allies. And that's how Pakistan's military started getting economic and military aid. Simultaneously, as Alvi had argued, but not developed this idea, like the Pakistani ruling classes were honestly incompetent as well. Unlike Nehru and the Congress party and other leaders who had 50 years of experience of and writing and reading, Pakistan came into being in a great hurry. So Jinnah also had no idea about why, what sort of state this would be. So this vacuum of a lack of political leadership, a lack of infrastructure, a lack of economic power, all that resulted that Pakistan turns toward the West for aid. And the Americans were, the Americans took about three years before they accepted Pakistan's plea to arm them. So 51 is when the first military aid starts coming and then again in 54 and 59. But one thing maybe I should mention here, in the 54 and 59 uh, agreements, military agreements, pacts with the US, not in the pact, but one day later, the State Department issued a statement that the military pact means that the arms are only to be used to defend Pakistan against Soviet communism. They are not to be used in a war against India. Pakistan violated that by, you, by starting the 65 war, by sending the, their freedom fighters into Kashmir. And thereafter, Pakistan's patronage by the Americans, they started getting concerned that these people get military aid from us but not to fight communism, but to arm themselves against India. And then that sort of continued. We'll take you back to 1947. Yeah. During 1947, resources uh, were uh, distributed yeah. and people were uh, forced to migrate. Yes. And one of the important elements which happened during 1947 is that Pakistan got disproportionately large number of army personnel. One can say that. Yeah. So is it is that one of the factors to make Pakistan garrison state? Well, once again, if you include the people of East Pakistan in 47, then it's not a dispop. But only in West Pakistan, which is now Pakistan, the Pakistan military was quite large. But they were not armed in any sense like a modern army. The British once assets... You, once you say that state, yeah. which is going to be represented by... Uh, army uh, by the bureaucracy and yeah. so on. If you have, uh, these are the people who are the experienced people. That's correct. Although they are supposed to run a post-colonial state, they yeah. come with colonial experience. That's so right. if they are taking the decision, so they, their will or their desire will somehow get reflected in that. Yes, because unless there is a strong political leadership, which was absent in Pakistan, Jinnah, the founder, died already on 11th of August. The Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan was assassinated in 51. After that, there was a leadership uh, dearth. There were no leaders to take over. So the bureaucracy took over. Bureaucracy could only work for a while. Then the army stepped in. And since then, Pakistan has always had the army calling the shots from front or from behind. So it means the tension between uh, democratic forces and non-democratic forces, mm. if I can say so, was already there when the Pakistan got formed. I would say that Pakistan had no democratic forces, except maybe some intellectuals. Our leadership was communal. It used religion. But one of the promise was democracy. No, that was only one speech of Jinnah, which I have argued was not so much about democracy or secularism, because in that speech, he, if he really wanted Pakistan to be secular, he should have given the example of Turkey. He doesn't. Or of the Soviet Union as a secular state. He gives 
the example of the British over time becoming, we will become something like Britain. But Britain even in 47 uh, had the, uh, the king as the head of the Anglican church. So that speech I have explained has no secular democratic content. It was meant to convince the Indian government not to throw out 35 million Muslims from all over India. So and that's what happened. It was strategically more important. Strategically, yes, yes, sir. Okay. I have so, I've, I've argued at length to show that. So once you say that uh, there was no uh, force. Uh, Jinnah was not democratic. He was so, an autocrat. So there was no idea of uh, democracy. No. And there was no force to uh, uh, at least assert that we need to exactly. be democratic. Is Pakistan, when you say that it is a garrison state, Ji. is it going uh, the way it was supposed to or there is some difference? No, first of all, what Pakistan was supposed to be was not thought, uh, discussed at all. Jinnah to the ulama said it will be an Islamic state. To some secular people he said democracies in the blood of Muslims, things like this, very loose words. But no coherent uh, vision of a Pakistan. So in the end, everybody has a speech of Jinnah which contradicts what you have. So I have said Pakistan came into being without a vision. But it had to find some vision. And then since it had been created all in the name of Islam, the main source of inspiration came from Islam and the result is today that Pakistan is a state in which there are openly undemocratic laws. Like blasphemy law here is, can you have in a democracy a law which encourages people to go and lynch someone because he is holding views which are not the right ones about religion. This is what happens in Pakistan all the time. So Pakistan legal system uh, over time has been corrupted by this Islamization. I'm saying they tried to fill in the vacuum by going back into Islam and what they brought in from Islam were repressive laws. Okay. So that's the problem. I'll just take you back. So when yeah. you talk about the vacuum, yeah. when you talk about the incoherent vision, yeah. and when you talk about the absence of democratic idea and forces, yeah. is that an opportunity for the army? Yes, the army then seeing that the politicians were making a mess of the economy, the mess today was there also in the 50s, by the way. There were floods, nobody took care of that. There was an acute food shortage. Even India had to depend on American food aid. But Pakistan definitely, I remember eating red wheat, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, uh, our politicians were corrupt. Yeah. Already Nawab Mamdot, who was the first prime, uh, chief minister of Punjab, he was accused of using his public office for his own corruption. This you can't say about the leadership of India. From Nehru all to uh, uh, Shastri Saab, these people were clean. Uh, and I don't know about now, but at that time, Indian leadership was not personally corrupt. We started with corruption from day one. Jinnah Saab, I think, was a man very greedy, you know, Having had India divided and everything, he had a, mission, a message sent to uh, Nehru not to take over his house in Bombay, to rent it out to Europeans and get him 3,000 rupees as monthly rent. When millions of people were in the refugee camps because of his two nation theory and his call for Pakistan. So Jinnah was greedy. The if house, one is uh, taking care of the property that he legitimately owns, he, how does it make someone greedy and uh, conclude that uh, the person can be corrupt? I think that uh, you are just extending that art. No, I am saying that there is a moral question. Yeah. You have India divided on the basis of religion. Millions of people have been thrown out of their homes. Aji, they are lying in these refugee camps. And you in your speeches have uh, demonized Nehru and Gandhi and all as uh, fascists and so on. Now for your own property, you go on your knees and says, don't take over my property. Would you like to do that? Simply because actually he couldn't claim it because he was no longer an Indian citizen. 
so i think his greed was more powerful than anything else that's what i'm saying okay so uh, you have explained how pakistan and america collaborated yeah. uh, till say 1965 that's correct but your book goes on till 2011 yes so uh, can you just trace uh, that the, the, the new, new chance, chance for america came when the soviet union came to afghanistan so that was 1980s 19 uh, late yeah. 70s early 79 80s. yeah 79. 79 okay and then once again a lot of economic aid and military aid came to ziaul haq the third time the americans pumped in dollars was when they started the war on terror and musharraf joined it so that is 2003 2000 and uh, one onwards one onwards one onwards yes yeah. 911 onwards 911 onwards okay so uh, mm, so there are three phases first of, phase yeah american aid to uh, pakistani army yeah. uh, military aid to yes, pakistan sir. and FB economic message, aid yes. and economic aid so economic aid is part of the military package yeah. only yeah so first phase is till 65 yeah till that time there is a rider that yeah. you can't use these arms resources yes. against india yeah. am yes, i correct sir. this is absolutely. what you yeah, yeah. absolutely so thereafter what happens to this rider one is that pakistan breaches the promise yeah the, uh, what about americans so when they send uh, military packages yeah the second time the americans need pakistan soldiers to fight the soviet union so they pay and you fight for them so then there is no condition there is no even jaul haq was very sharp he forced the americans not to impose the pressler statement stopping pakistan from getting the nuclear capability to produce a weapon so pakistan also played its game by saying oh we fight your war in afghanistan but you keep your eyes away from what we are doing so that's how pakistan got its nuclear capability you just explain it a bit more uh, there were two three american congress resolutions one is known as the pressler amendment or resolution saying that pakistan's nuclear uh, uh, weapon is in the direction of getting capability and we have to prevent it so this was still applying when the soviet came into afghanistan and the americans now wanted to get revenge for what happened in uh, vietnam in vietnam mm-hmm. so they came to the pakistanis and jawlak was more than ready he said we do the fighting we do the fighting you don't come here you give us the money you give us all, all other assistance but and then when he started doing that and proving effective he also made the americans turn their face in another direction and they continued with their nuclear uh, capability development and they got their weapon so that's the second phase the third phase once again is uh, 9/11 and then the americans threatening pakistan either you are with us or you are against us and musharraf then joining the war on terror and so to fight the war on terror once again the american dollars started coming in and musharraf writes in his book that we arrested al qaeda people and got millions of dollars he says it, it, he has mentioned it in his book in in the line of fire or something he himself admits that so pakistan Pakistan's garrison state uh, was developed in ideologically i would say the garrison state has is a metaphor which i've used L- last well maybe i had not thought about it but i thought about what is a garrison a garrison is an outpost of an empire or a state where you create garrison so that the enemy the first attack of the enemy is met by the garrison but it is also an order you can give to the garrison to go out and attack another so in pakistan they start, started saying after they got the nuclear weapon capability that we are the front line state now of the islamic umma that the only state which has nuclear weapon, weapons among muslims is pakistan so we are now the front line state and and jinnah and and musharraf is on record saying 
پاکستان اسلام کا قلعہ ہے اینڈ آئی سیٹ قلعہ مینس بوتھ تھنگس فرسٹ ٹو ڈیفینڈ بٹ آلسو ٹو اوفینڈ دا اوفینسو کین بی That's the total idea of the garrison state. So once you say that Pakistan is a garrison state, it means that garrison is very much central to the whole status of Pakistan. Absolutely. Yeah. And now the proof, we don't even have to dispute it. Just see the last election. Everybody knows that people with even a lack of votes winning by that margin have been defeated and people who had nothing are, have been declared Uh, victors and so we have a government chosen by the same establishment so if that establishment is so powerful yeah then how did it, uh, it happen simultaneously that people keep on demanding elections and election keeps on happening it means Because the very idea of election uh, is not uh, delivering as it is promised it is not delivering yeah but the people are not giving up because We live in a world where everybody is informed how every, here Modi ji, you may not like him or so, but there is an election going on, political parties are there and like always there will be an election and a result will be declared. We have never had that opportunity. So two states came into being on the same date. One went on to establish at least electoral democracy, Haji, right or wrong, but it continues. We have not been able to do that from day one. Do you know that the first free and fair general election was held in 1970? And when the election was held, uh, Pakistan broke up because the result produced a majority for the Bangladeshis. And the West Pakistanis were not willing to give them the government. And so Pakistan broke up. So democracy is like this in Pakistan. So uh, do you think that this kind of state where uh, military uh, complex is the dominant mm. is linked to somehow a global state in the present scenario? It started as part of the Americans creating many garrison states. Pakistan was one. Mm. South Korea was another. South Korea went on to be a democracy. Mm. Okay. So Taiwan was also originally a garrison state. They have also become a democracy. So there are many states which have somehow managed to become democracy even when they started as a garrison state. None of them violated the American rules. We did by using their weapons to wage war against India. In the American calculation, let me put it on record. From day one, they didn't want the partition of India because for them, the experience of communism was not Stalin. Stalin had proved to be a good ally during the war, but the Chinese were winning and they were backing the common tank. So they wanted a strong armies, armed India, which is secular and democratic the way Congress wanted. But the partition was done by the British because they had a different understanding. They thought Soviet Union is the main enemy. Okay. Uh, but now, for example, you will see that the Americans and Indians are now very good friends. But this was the original American intention. But Nehru and these people who were anti-imperialist, leftists, they were leaning towards the Soviet Union. All that is gone now. So again, I'll go back to the global state yeah. uh, of the present time. When we talk uh, with reference of uh, Ukraine, yeah. with reference of Israel, On the one hand, there are uh, militaries yeah. with brute force. Yeah. And on the other hand, there are ideas like human rights, democratic rights, mm. all the humans are equal. And it seems that these are ideas are very weak uh, as long as the decision making from the global state is uh, I expected. I totally agree with you. This is what I've been deploring, lamenting. I have said, can't you learn from history? Why can't we Asians and Africans now take charge of our own societies and not be part of a global order which orders us to do this and do that? But for that, we need to have that consciousness to change this whole thing. This world order is held by the military uh, uh, 
uh, arms industry you know they want wars to keep uh, going on to test their latest weapons because then in the market their product will sell so it so, means the global state is much closer to uh, pakistan as far as character is concerned well there is no denying of that the only problem now with pakistan is the americans don't need pakistan anymore uh the saudis used to support pakistan vis-a-vis -vis iran they don't need pakistan either any anymore it's only the chinese who are backing pakistan and i've said to my indian friends if you can work out your international border with india with china and that becomes accepted pakistan's role as china's ally would become redundant so india should actually seriously think of sorting its border with china i would even say to the risk of being a bit that in in 62 61 the offer of joint line and all was a fair one india should have accepted it but there were too many emotions and so on and uh, so that's a problem but one day they'll have to sort it out uh, but you know when you do this give and take always happens so that's not for me to tell india what to do but pakistan's role which was there in while the cold war was going on is no longer relevant while china saudi saudis and iranians were fighting their role is also over now it's only uh, china needs pakistan just as the americans need india but if india and china can work out their border dispute i tell you we will enter a new era in this region so then what is the future of pakistan in that then pakistan situation? will have to give up this garrison state and become a normal state like all others respecting international law ha ji doing trade with i have said to pakistanis look you do many things for the bidding of chinese have the chinese stop trading with india the way you have close trade with india why don't the chinese do it for your sake they don't they couldn't give a damn so i said the loser in all this is pakistan so trade with pakistan would be good for everyone but especially for pakistan where uh, people are suffering uh, greatly because of the economy having stagnated nothing is happening in pakistan and we have such a huge debt to clear also professor ishtiak thank you very much for talking to us thank you very much diljeet ami ji for inviting me it has always been a pleasure and i consider it a privilege to come and talk to you and in this studio we have had discussions in the past as well let's hope this continues thank you so much and thank you very much for joining so professor uh, ishtiak ahmed has uh, traced the whole trajectory of pakistan till date and he has talked about the apprehensions and about the possibilities uh, of a peaceful south asia as well i hope you will appreciate these ideas and engage with these ideas thank you very much